Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus Christ? As you sat and listened to that, did that shake you a little bit? Some of those answers are startling. Some of them are offensive. Shocking. I trust that if we were to do the same thing in here today, if we were to go around and pass a mic and say, who is Jesus Christ, that our answers would be dramatically different. I hope that's the case. And yet, as we have decorated and we have sung, we are celebrating his incarnation, our annual celebration of his incarnation. Who are we celebrating? Who are we celebrating? Who is Jesus Christ? And I think many of us would have words to say. We'd have things we'd assent to, truth that we would add. The question I want us to consider today, though, is what we do. Is what we do match what we think? If we were to turn these video cameras around and for our watching audience, ask you who is Jesus, you'd give a great answer. But when we were to follow you perhaps tomorrow, would it be similar? Would the reality of Christ be living out in your life? Is it seen? And that's really what I wanted to challenge us with today. We're going to be looking at Psalm chapter 2. So if you'll turn your Bibles with me to Psalm chapter 2. I believe the psalmist here provides really a very important response to this very question. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Let's read, to, read it as I follow along as I read. Psalm chapter 2. Why are the nations in an uproar and the people devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us tear their fetters apart and cast their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at him. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord, he said to me. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now, therefore, O king, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son, that he will not become angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all those who take refuge in him. Clearly, we see the response in Psalm 2. Who is Jesus? God answers that question very affirmatively. In verse 6, he is my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. Jesus is God's anointed king, reigning over all mankind. That is who Jesus is. And so as we consider this text today, I want for us to be looking at our own hearts and saying, how am I responding to the king? Is he my king? We heard some say, no, he's not my king. Is he your king? And if he is your king, how are you responding to his authority in your life? What does that look like? We're going to look at the text today. The text presents for us really four perspectives, very clearly laid out. If you need to do an outline, it's there in your bulletin. But the first three verses lay out the perspective of the people, the nations, the heathen. The next three verses, verses 4 to 6, lay out the perspective of God himself. Verses 7 to 9 present the perspective of Christ himself, and then the author of the psalm concludes by giving him giving his own perspective. And so through these four perspectives, I want us to evaluate our own response to the one we say we're celebrating, to Jesus the King. Before we do that, let's pray and ask God's help as we consider the Word of God this morning. Father, thank you for your abundant mercy to us. Thank you, as we have just heard sung, that Jesus saves. What an amazing thought that you would send your son, the king of all the earth, to pay the penalty of our sin so that we could be redeemed and have 
a relationship with you and be joint heirs with Jesus, our King. What an amazing thing. Lord, we don't deserve that. Even as believers, we don't stand in our own merit. We only stand in your grace. Lord, as we look at Psalm 2 this morning, we would ask for your help. We'd ask that you would lay aside distractions, that you would help us to focus on what you're saying to us through your word, that even my words would be a help to that, that you would um, speak through me. May I not be a distraction to what you would want to have accomplished today by us considering this text. Who is Jesus? Who is your king? How should we respond? Lord, we are rebellion. We are rebellious by nature. And Lord, may we see areas of our lives today that we need to submit to you, to our king, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, let's look at the text this morning. We begin really with the first perspective, and that is the perspective of man, and we will see man's rejection of Christ's reign. Why are the nations in an uproar and the people devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. He says, let us tear apart their fetters. Let's cast their cords from us. And as you see, mankind is presented as being in direct rebellion to the authority of Christ. Look at the language that the the psalmist uses. Amazing. He says, the nations are in an uproar. The word is literally like the roaring of a sea tossed to and fro. I don't know how many of you have seen um, those lighthouses that are being overwhelmed by the waves. And I always wonder, where do they put those? Where are those lighthouses that you see in those famous pictures? Or we have seen that the word also reminds me of people raging. We have seen on the television screen uh, from around the world, people raging together in protest. And while that historically has not been really the mindset of the American culture, it's becoming one, right? Even this week, we've seen raging protests. And that's the picture here. People raging together in protest. Notice another word. They're devising. They're devising a vain thing. The idea of that word is to meditate, to muse. It literally is the word that's used in Psalm 1, where the righteous man meditates on God's word. So here we have people in a rage meditating on and being hateful toward God and toward his king. It's a premeditated hatred that people are presenting against the rule and reign of Christ. Man desires to really be loosed from the bonds that God is putting on them. And really, it's a missed perspective. We know that God would love them. In fact, um, we know that Jesus even said, if the Son makes you free, you'll be free indeed. It's a freedom that, that God is bringing through Christ and not and not bondage. And so here we see men choosing to prepare for battle rather than submission. There's a couple things to look at this rebellion that we see. First of all, this rejection of Christ is universal. Verse 2 speaks of the kings of the earth. Really, as representative of all mankind, the kings of the earth are coming together to reject Christ's authority. The revolt really is widespread. We know that because in verse 8, when God tells Christ his inheritance will be all the nations. He'll cover all of the earth. And so we really see a universal rejection of God's king. This is consistent with what we see in Scripture. Psalm 53 speaks of God looking down from heaven on the sons of men to see if anyone would understand. And what's the response? No, there are none. There's no one who does good, not even one. Even the salvation that God brings through Christ is rejected. Paul in First Coloss- Corinthians rather, chapter 1 speaks of uh, Christ's cross being a stumbling block to the Jews and really foolishness to the Gentiles. And we see that even in our own day. I think the amazing thing is we look at the New Testament that mankind's rejection of Christ will continue all the way to the end. As you read through the book of Revelation, you see judgment after judgment being poured out on mankind. And yet, even in chapter 16, we see them blaspheming God in their pain and la- failing to repent. And so, here we, what's presented here, the rejection, the, the rebellion of mankind is a universal rejection. And yet, it's interesting, as we look in the New Testament, we see that this rejection of Christ is also specific. If you recall in Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 4, what, what's going on in Acts 4? In Acts chapter 4, we've got the disciples. They've been called in before the Sanhedrin, and they've been threatened. In fact, they've been beaten and said, listen, do not speak anymore in the name of Christ. And after that, 
occurrence we find at the end of Acts chapter 4, we find them praying and really thanking God for the opportunity to serve. And in particular, they reference Psalm 2. They say, the heathen rage, and they gather together against the Lord and against his Christ. And so very specifically, the psalmist is referring to the rejection of Christ and the fact that they put him on the cross. And so we really see here then this, the rejection of mankind against Christ's reign. And I need for us to step back and take a look and say, how is that impactful to us today? How should we respond to what we see around us? This is not a surprise to any of us, is it? We read the first three verses and you go, yes, that's my experience. It's what we saw presented for us. Can you imagine the folks that are driving just a hundred yards from where I'm standing? Most of them probably would have a similar response. Who is Jesus? He's nothing to me. He certainly didn't die for my sins. Oh, he was just a fiction. Oh, he's just all of us. He's the good in all of us. What does your heart do when you hear someone say that? What does your heart do? Does it give you a little pit in your stomach? When we can hear triumphantly sung how Jesus saves and yet mankind rejects it? The question I want you to consider today is how are you going to respond to that? We know that. This is not a shock to us. I didn't hear anyone say, I can't believe people are saying that about Jesus. It's what we experience in the world, right? How do you respond to that? What does that do to you who know and profess Jesus Christ as your king? What does it do to your mouth? Does it cause you to say, yeah, I know what their response is going to be. I'm not even going to tell them about Jesus. Or in our day, I can't even wish them Merry Christmas at the store, right? Happy holidays. Have a good holiday. You see, as we'll see in a moment, when when mankind rages against God, it doesn't change God. And we who know Jesus as our king must not let the rejection of mankind to stifle us and be verbal about who he is. I mean, one of the ways we can demonstrate the reign of Christ in our hearts is by verbalizing that to others. Who is Jesus? I mean, this is the time of year when his name is used probably more than any other time other than Easter, perhaps. The music we sing, the music in the stores. Who is Jesus? He's my king. He died for you. So let's not allow the response that we already know is happening and will happen as the Bible presents all the way to the end, right? Revelation presents continued rebellion of God's reign through Christ all the way to the end. We know know the end. We must not allow that to stifle our witness, our verbal witness, our testimony for Christ. We know their response. You know, God, God is not so weak that he cannot open their hearts and eyes, right? To the truth of the gospel. So I trust that as you consider the opportunities that you have this season, many of you will have opportunities to interact with coworkers, perhaps family members that you don't see very often that are lost. And I know those are difficult times. I've talked to some of you that have lost family members. Christmas time and the holiday time is extremely difficult. It can be. And yet, I trust that you will pray for new opportunities. You already know your family's rejecting Christ, perhaps. Pray for new opportunities to talk about the reign of Christ, to talk about who he is. Don't allow the rejection to thwart your witness. Don't do that. And I think, so then, as we look at this, really this first perspective of the rejection of Christ's authority, we must not allow that to hinder our efforts for his kingdom. Be challenged with that. Let's move on to really the next then perspective. And this is God's perspective. 
God's perspective. God recognizes the rejection of the authority of Jesus, the response that man is giving. And really, at the beginning of the psalm, the author even hints at God's response. He, the, the psalm begins with a question, why are the nations in an uproar? Uh, he recognizes, the psalmist recognizes really the vanity of mankind asserting itself against God. And ultimately, in verse 6, the psalmist records God's affirmation of Christ's authority. And yet, before he gets there, he presents four progressive responses that God has to this rebellion against the authority of Christ. It's interesting to note, what is God doing? Is he all in an uproar? No, he, he's sitting calmly. Man is in a furious uproar, and what is God doing? He is sitting. And notice the responses. His first response is laughter. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The audacity of man to think that they can rebel against him. One commentator put it this way, rebellion against God's rule is as hopeless as if the stars were to combine to abolish gravity. It's hopeless. I don't know how many of you have pets. If you have a dog as a pet, we all know that dogs are the best pets. Sorry, all you cat people out there. We have a particularly small dog, and it always amazes me, this small little dog. If the doorbell were to ring or someone were to come in, the response that she gives is as if she were a full-grown Rottweiler, and she is going to attack that intruder with all her fury not realizing that her legs are that long. And if there were an intruder, I'm sure he would, do, he would look at her and go, yeah, right. <laughs> I'm coming in anyway, whether you want me to or not. It's, it's ridiculous to think that she is our guard dog. It's ridiculous for man to think that they can thwart God's plan. And he responds with laughter. Notice the next laughter. The laughter turns into scoffing or ridicule, mocking. From there it goes to anger. He will speak with them in his anger. God is not pleased with the rejection of the one he's given full authority. You say, well, that, is that a right response? Is it right for God to be angry? Absolutely. God is not sinful in his anger. It is appropriate for God to be angry and jealous over the violation of his will and over his authority. He is God. And then ultimately it turns to fury. He terrifies them in his fury. He alarms them with his burning anger. And we see that as God is patient in this time, yet we know from the, from the end of time that God will pour out his wrath on earth. And so the psalmist concludes then really with God's affirmation. Look at verse 6. But as for me, God speaking here, I have installed my king upon Zion. I have set him. I have consecrated him. I have established him. I have anointed him king. And so mankind may put their shoulders to the throne of the anointed to overthrow it, but God's hands hold it firm, whatever forces press against it. All the self-will in the world does not alter the fact that the authority of Christ is sovereign over human wills. And for those of us that profess knowledge of Christ, we need to look at this and say, how do we respond? God has set his king. In a very real way, we celebrate the coming of the king. He is the king. And how do we respond to that? What are right responses? I think a first right response is a response of a right attitude. Submission to his authority in every aspect of our lives. What does that look like? Submitting to God's authority in every aspect of our lives. It means that we look at the word of God as real instruction. We're serious about what the word of God says. We don't take it lightly. We don't say, you know what, that particular thing doesn't apply to me. That must be really too hard. You look at some of the things that Christ said in the Gospels, and you read them, and you go, how can I do that? How can I love the one that hates me? How can I respond constantly with kindness? How can I keep foul communication out of my mouth? How can I always forgive? See, Having a right attitude about God's authority is we look at those instructions and say, those are for me. Instead of saying, you know what, those are really hard, so it must be I can't do them, so I'm just going to lay, I'm not going to worry about those right now. 
It means that we respond with the right attitude. God's truth is truth for us, truth that we live. And then I think it also has, it also means that we have the right perspective. We see God's sovereignty in all things. In other words, as we go about life, we understand that God is in control and that he has uh, set things for us in a particular way. We make decisions seeking God's direction. Now, now we can do this in, in rate ways that are kind of ridiculous. You know, I was on my way to the store, and I got a flat tire, so that must be whatever I was going to buy at the store God didn't want me to buy. Well, tires go flat because, well, one, you hit something in the road, or, or you, you don't maintain them correctly, right? Your car breaks down because it didn't get maintained correctly. And so I don't mean to be mystical about what God's will is and what God's sovereignty is, but recognize that he is in control. And when difficulty comes into our lives, we recognize that he is doing something for us. He is helping us see who we are. We think of Abraham. Uh, Abraham comes to mind. Uh, Did Abraham have some difficulty in his life? If you were to think of Abraham, what was the maybe biggest difficulty that God brought into his life? You can say it. Sacrificing his son. Why do you think God did that? Did God need to know what was in the heart of Abraham? No. Did Abraham need to know? Yes, in a very real way, that test was for him. And so we can respond correctly to God's rule by saying, when you bring something into my life, Lord, what is it that I need to understand? Life is hard. Life is not a bed of roses. You think about life, many times you'd think, you know, if I could have everything, have all the knowledge and experience that I have right now, and be about eight years old. Right? You remember being eight years old? I mean, you barely knew what money was, and if it was something, it was something that dad just, he just did this, right? There it is. And it, life was great at eight years old. You had no responsibility. Life is difficult. Difficulty comes into all of our lives to varying degrees. And yet, as God brings that in, we, we trust his perspective. God, you are here to reveal that you're using things to help me understand who I am and who you are. And I think that's how we can respond correctly to his sovereignty. Let's continue on. Let's look then now also for perspective of Christ, this third perspective, Christ's perspective on his reign. Let's read verses 7 through 9 again. I will surely tell of the decree the Lord He said to me, you are my son, and today I have begotten you. You see, that is Christ speaking because he is the only one that can say that. Surely I will tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the ends of the earth is your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. And so here we see Christ speaking, really giving his perspective on the authority that God has given to him as his king. And there's really three aspects of this reign that I want to talk about. First of all, the timing of his ascent to power. Very interesting text where it says, you are my son today, I have begotten you. And in a very real sense, that sounds like it's saying this is the statement of when Christ was born, and yet that's not at all what it's talking about. In the, in the book of Acts, we have a clearer glimpse of exactly what the psalmist is speaking of as Paul begins his missionary journey. He's in Poseidon, Antioch, and he literally uses this text to refer to the fact that Christ has risen from the dead in Acts uh, 13, 32 to 33, if you want to go back and look at that, where he raised Christ from the dead, and, he, and, the, and Paul applies this statement, you are my son, today I've begotten you. This is the resurrection of Christ. The beginning of Christ is his resurrection from the dead, and therefore his ascent to power came after he obeyed everything that God had laid out for him to do as he came to earth. In Philippians chapter 2, we see that where where Christ came and gave himself, gave everything, and then as a result of that, God exalted him. God highly exalted him. So in a sense, the timing of Christ's ascent to power was after his death, burial, and resurrection, and yet Scripture presents even a clearer case for the fact that it was before the foundation of the world. In Ephesians chapter 1, we have this statement, just as he, just as God chose us in him, that is Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. Peter also writes in 1 Peter 1 
the the end of that chapter, verses 19 and 20, that Christ was foreknown before the foundation of the world. The idea there is that Christ's sacrifice, that he was going to make his begetting, his resurrection, was foreknown before we were even born. In other words, as you study out what it says in Ephesians chapter 1 there, before we had the need, God had made the plan. And so his ascent to power is really from the beginning of time. Notice also the extent of his reign. Verse 8 lays that out for us. It's a complete and universal reign. He reigns over all people at all, over all times, all kingdoms of the earth. That was God's plan. As Christ returned to heaven, he, re, he told his uh, disciples what? I have, I have all authority. I have all authority in heaven and in earth. His reign is an extensive reign. I want us to ponder a moment the nature of his reign. What do you think it means here? You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. I don't know if you've, uh, how many of you still garden with clay pots? I, I, can you still get clay pots today? It seems like every time I go to Home Depot, they're all plastic. They look like clay, but they're plastic. Think of a clay pot and think of a crowbar. What's going to happen if you hit that pot even lightly with that crowbar? It's done, right? It's shattered. It's shattered. And yet, as one commentator aptly pointed out, there, there really are two kinds of breaking that are present here. There's a merciful breaking. There's a shattering of our pride and our self when we come to the cross, is there not? He rules us with a rod of iron. He breaks us as earthenware. When? When we come to the cross and realize in faith and repentance that we need him. That's a merciful breaking. And then there's a terrible one as well, those who reject that, that will be crushed, that fail to surrender to his authority in faith and repentance. And so as we look at how Christ describes his reign, how do we respond to his reign? How do we respond to him particularly? I have three suggest a threefold response, I think, and and I'm sure that if we spent time, we could have many, many more. But as we look at the reign and person of Christ, I think one adequate or appropriate response is really a constant adoration for him. We'll sing, and we may have sung. I lose track of what Christmas songs we've sung already. I'm thankful for Pastor Scott, who keeps track of all that. It does seem to me that we sing Glory and Excelsior's Day a lot. I don't know, is that just because it's in every song? Or is it just me that has that problem? But we will be singing, Oh, come, let us adore him. And yes, we think of adoring a child. A newborn baby is adorable, right? Are there really any ugly babies? We... Do <laughs> you know what you say when you see an especially ugly baby? Now that's a baby. And then you're safe, right? So if you ever hear me say that... I'm in real trouble, all right? Okay. So I've let my secret out. Now that's a baby. Um, If I say that to you, it's not because I think your baby's ugly, all right? Let me just get that out there. It's just because I forgot that I've already told you that. Anyway, how should we respond to the reign of Christ, the reign that he's been given? We should come with adoration before him. He loves us. And, And that word adoration almost sounds too formal, we don't use it a lot, right? Do you, do you walk up to your wife and say, I adore you? Maybe you should. Love for Christ, for who he is. The king, the king that rules over all people of all time and yet <clears throat> sacrificed himself for us. Adoration <clears throat> is an appropriate response. Constant adoration. Another appropriate response would be what I'm calling contrition for our sin. What do I mean by that? Recognizing the sin that we continue to allow in our lives was paid for by his sacrifice. Do you look at your sin that way? Or do you just give yourself a free pass? You know, that's just who I am. You know, I... I, I just, I'm a hothead, right? And I, and I, that I just blow up. I, after a while, I just can't do it. I can't take it anymore. Christ died for that sin. 
your king paid for that sin. First John chapter 1 talks about walking in the light as he is in the light, as God is in the light. And, and, and through that process, being cleansed from sin. And I think w- what John is trying to communicate there is that as we walk in the light, as we interact with God and sin is exposed, that we quickly confess and, and release and say, Lord, that, that's not what I want to be. I want to be like you. I want to stay in fellowship with you. And I think responding to Christ's reign as our king, that's something we would do. That sin is a big deal for us, even as believers, that we're constantly sensitive to it. Sensitive to how we're walking. James chapter 4 speaks of cleansing our hands and purifying our hearts. And I think that's something that we, would, that we should be doing. And then I think a third response is just constrained to his service. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if I'm thinking correctly, 2 Corinthians 5 talks about the fact that the love of Christ controls us and that because Christ died for us, that we are no longer ourselves. But we belong to the one who died. We belong to our king. And as a result of that love and work that Christ did for us, that we're constrained to serve him. Wherever God puts us, you serve God in your profession as a doctor or whatever you do, you serve him. Your mouth speaks of him with those that you come in contact with. You look for ways to be a part of the body. You find your place to fill in this body. I love how Paul talks about the church as a, as a body that has parts that all work. We all know that because when we break something in, on our body and it doesn't work, it's very difficult to function. And that's truly how the church is. When the church has a body part that's not functioning, it's very difficult for us to be effective. So we're constrained to service, joining a body of Christ and serving him to accomplish his purposes. That's how we respond to the rule of Christ. And then let's, let's look <clears throat> to close. We'll look at the, the author's warning, really a, a very strong warning. He says, now, therefore, O king, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son that he will not become angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. I love how he closes, how blessed are all who take refuge in him. So here the author takes the opportunity. He's, he's seen what the people are doing. He's seen God's response. He's seen Christ's response. And now he steps back and gives a warning. Since these things are so, since this is true of Christ's rule, now here is my advice. And he gives three pieces of advice. First, he says, you must understand reality. Show discernment, O kings. In other words, be wise, be prudent, take warning. You know, he's saying you may have your own wisdom. You may think what you really think is true. But quite frankly, what God says always conforms to reality. We can think things are a certain way, but if they're not the way God says they are, then we're, we're in a fog, we're deluded. God's truth always conforms to reality. What God says is real. Have the right perspective. And we see that. We see that in the, we we can call it worldview. We can interact with people in the world that have a worldview that's completely excluded God as a part of it. And yet we need to make sure that we're functioning in reality. Notice, secondly, you must worship and rejoice in Christ. Our recognition of Christ's rule should produce two outcomes, worship and rejoicing. This idea of worship actually also includes the idea of service, enslaved servitude, actually. And so, quite frankly, our service is a part of our worship for the worthiness of Christ and who he is. Worship is simply just responding with a heart that is fully committed to Christ. I wonder, we call this time a worship service. I often wonder how much worship is really going on. Are we really worshiping? Do you stand in awe of who Christ is and what he has done for you when you come into this room once a week? Or are you simply fulfilling a cultural obligation that you grew up with? You know, we, ever since I was three, we go to church, and that's what we do on Sunday. It's church day. And we sing certain songs, and we have this guy talk to us too long, right? Right? 
where's worship in that? So how do you worship when you're talking? Well, here's how you worship when a pastor is talking or someone is speaking. You, you respond to the truth that God is pointing out to you. You know, God may point out something to you while I'm talking that has nothing to do with what we talked about because of his spirit through the word, perhaps in a text that I'm not even speaking from. How do you respond to that? God points out something in your life. Maybe he's talking today about how you submit to his authority. Worship is responding by saying, yes, God, you're right. I'm committed to that truth and I'm going to live it. That's worship. I wish I'd say this out loud, but I almost wish we didn't call this a worship service. I prefer to call it a congregational gathering or something like that. An assembly, that's what it is. We're assembling together as the body of Christ. And yes, in that we should be worshiping, but by saying it's a worship service, it implies what? It it implies that I only worship on Sunday at 1030. No. No. Our whole life should be worship. When you wake tomorrow, I trust you have a time of worship. If that's not just singing, we certainly can worship through singing. But what I mean is that as you're interacting with the word in the morning, tomorrow morning, hopefully, if that's your time, that you are worshiping God as you see his truth and you praise him for who he is and your heart explodes with joy. So let me challenge you, how much worship the author saying we should worship and rejoice in Christ when we come together is it real worship so i can't really worship to a christmas song i'm there with you sometimes those are they we've sung them a lot right we should though i was mentioning to pastor mayor the new song he's teaching us how really very singable that is and the text how strong it is it's helpful to me Uh, I've been singing these Christmas songs for many years. And and I like to hear new texts that help me stay focused on who Christ is so that I can worship him. So we need to worship and we need to rejoice. We can rejoice in him. And then finally, author's advice is that we yield to him and take refuge. Do homage there literally means just submit. It's a symbolic act of indicating, really indicates our allegiance and our submission and take refuge. It means to trust in, to yield to him and, take, and trust in him. And so as we step back and consider who is Jesus, which of these perspectives are most instructive to you as you live out this week? Man's rejection of Christ's reign Will you no longer allow the rejection of the lost to hinder your boldness or your zeal? This is, this is Christmas time. It is about Christ. We are celebrating his coming to earth. Don't be shy about that. He is our king. What about God's affirmation of Christ's reign? Will you live in submission to his reign and his sovereignty in your life? Will you be submissive to the truth of his word? How about in Christ's explanation of his reign? Will you respond to the person of Christ with adoration, love, contrition over sin, and constrained service to him? And will you take the author's advice? Will you live in the reality of God's truth, worshiping and rejoicing in his sacrifice? Who is Jesus? He's our king. He is God's anointed ruler of all mankind. Why don't we close our eyes and stand together? I'll ask uh, instrumentals to come.